Uh, my name is uh, Wim Hendricks. I was, uh, so I'm from Nokia. So I was supposed to be accompanied by John but, uh, from Google, but unfortunately, he couldn't make it, so you have to deal with me. Um, so the talk that I'm going to give, uh, the title is rather extensive, right? But I think there is three important aspects that I believe that are represented in the title that are important. So the first one is collaboration. The second is manifests, and the third is scale in complex organizations. So I think these are the three main themes that I'm going to, uh, let's say, talk about and try to get a representation on how we deal with this in a specific example. So I, because these are concepts which are uh, very generic, right? So I think it's always good to look at a specific example on how we could uh, deal with those. One thing I would say is that the example that I have is telco, because I'm from Nokia, right? Uh, there's also people from Ericsson here. So uh, what I want to say is that the example as such, or what you see here as a framework that we are building, is not specific to this use case. OK, so keep that in mind, right? So there was a talk this morning at 11 o'clock for someone who, says, uh, who was talking about how to deal with large YAML manifests in an organization, you see that the approach that we are taking is actually also applicable in such an environment, right? So keep that in mind. Eh? So we we'll use telco as a use case, but it's not limited to it, OK? Now, how many in the room are telco or from the telco space? Uh, so quite a bit, OK, thank you. So half of the room uh, somehow. There are a bunch of acronyms here, which probably for the rest of the people doesn't mean anything, right? So when I talk about UPF or SMF and AMF, think about I, as an app, and I'm looking at it as a network function. I, so that's how we call it. So it's a network function, it's an app. And when we talk about manifests, we talk about the manifest to deploy or configure such an app, right? So just to give you that perspective. Why? Did I put this example here? I, first of all, is what our main business is about. But secondly, there are two important things that you see here. It's one is scale. If you look to the numbers at the bottom, right, you see here on the, let's say, right hand side, 100,000 plus sites, right? So all of these things are being developed more and more in cloud native way. So that means that they are leveraging Kubernetes. So they will be deployed on a Kubernetes environment in a cloud native uh, stack. And as such, that gives a certain set of, let's say, complexities that we have to deal with, right? The second thing that you see with these workloads is they have quite some interdependencies. So you see here the, let's say, the lines in between those network functions. So they have dependencies between each other. So if you want to deploy them or if you want to operate them, you have to somehow deal with those relationships and dependencies, right? And I, that, of course, given this large scale, gives a set of uh, interesting attributes. And I, we are trying to address and uh, develop an approach that deals with that. Now, before I go into more of the solution or the approach that we are taking, I want to give you also a little bit of context, right? Why that organizational part that I put into the title is important, right? Because if you deal with this environment, you see that you have lots of relationship and dependencies, right? And it's not like, hey, I have here an application and I have all the freedom and I can do whatever I want and I deploy it. Uh, that's not what typically happens in the real world. We have people who are infrastructure people, we have people who are application, we have DB people, storage people, and so on and so forth. So we have uh, various roles inside an organization that deal with the particular uh, problem space that we uh, try to represent. Now, in particular, I. When we talk about the network function, so you have to keep in mind that I, we used to develop this as a hardware black box system, right, as a vendor. So that was, has been our main business. Now, with all the things that are happening in cloud native, you see that we are decoupling that and we are making it truly cloud native, runs on Kubernetes and so on and so forth. But the culture that we have inside this means we we had full control over everything, 
right? And we are going into a world where the amount of control that we have is lesser and lesser, right? We should only take care of the app, but the surrounding environment on which this is deployed is less and less under our control, right? Now, that also means that we have to, uh, that's a journey as a vendor, right? That you have to go through and understand how to do so. And that's also why those relationships and roles in this whole deployment and, and orchestration, if you will, are very important. Because what we used to do is we said, okay, we do cloud native, but we said, okay, this is the infrastructure on which this can be deployed, and you have no choice. <laughs> So probably, I, if you, I, people who are living in the true cloud native world, they will say, okay, that's not cloud native, right? So as such, what you see, it's important to get a set of, uh, define an environment on which those relationships and those dependencies, let's say, disappear and are decoupled. You can still say, I want a set of requirements, for example, how to deploy it, Numa, Azure IOV, and blah, 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 blah. But you, want, you don't want to be 100% in control. It's actually the infrastructure people that take care that that will happen, right? So uh, decoupling is going to be uh, important. The second or the third thing that is also uh, uh, very important and that led us to the approach is that I built this thing of a, of a house, right? So think of, for example, in this context, we have network compute, and storage, right? Each of that house is represented like that. Why I believe that Kubernetes is so successful is they gave you a plugin to make it extensible, right? So, and, and there is various vendors on CNIs, there is vendor, several vendors on storage and compute and stuff like that that could do their own thing, but they all were given an environment on which they could operate independently, right? If you look back on how we in the telco or as a vendor were operating, we want to be in full control of that house, right? So rather than saying here is a, here you can develop your app or put your app, we want to also define all the surroundings around it, right? And I was, I saw so the reason I came, I, or I'm talking about this is like four or five years ago, I started to onboard our applications on a public cloud environment. And I said, this is a challenge. <laughs> And I started to, inside of Nokia, say, OK, we have to change the approach that we are taking. Uh, it's not uh, working very well. We have too much dependencies, and so on and so forth. And so I started the journey to say, OK, we have to move more and more native to uh, inside of a Kubernetes environment and focus on the app. But the surroundings, we have to uh, define in such a way that they are uh, true cloud native. And we don't have to define the surroundings. We just have to be able to deploy or get deployed or get operationalized in that environment that someone else has uh, defined for us, right? And that led uh, to the following is that we, uh, in parallel to us, Google started an open source initiative which uh, is called Nephio. And I don't know who in the room has heard about Nephio before. Nobody, uh, very few. So like 10, 20 people. So, so Nephio is a project in the Linux, found, so LFN, so in Linux Foundation, on which we are developing this, right? So Google has pioneered that, but there are people from Ericsson, Nokia, several uh, service providers who together, where we are defining that architecture. Now, what is the goal of Nephio? Is basically, uh, as represented here onto the slide, is use Kubernetes as that unified layer and make sure that we can automate all our uh, elements in that environment. So rather than having our own house and so on and so forth, we want to use a unified Kubernetes layer on which those systems are built, right? And so, of course, this is a huge problem space, right? And so we divided that into three categories, right? Because to get a bit of context, so First category is, is what we call infrastructure, right? Is uh, developing or deploying clusters, right? Now, just to be clear, we are not going to uh, come up with a new cluster API system. We are just using it, right? Because we have to understand which clusters are there, and we potentially have to instantiate the cluster, right? But we are not going to take care of 
how to do it. We are just going to drive that, and we are going to use the tools that are available. Right? The second pillar is we have the uh, network functions right, that have to be deployed on a certain infrastructure, and we have to uh, deal with that. Right? And there's a third pillar, which is the configuration of those network functions. Right? Now, third pillar is a bit interesting, because if you look at uh, the pet versus cattle approach, eh, so uh, what is actually the configuration uh, management is that you have an, an existing, let's say, container running, and you want to change the configuration of it while running. Right? So you can have two approaches. You could say, hey, I deploy a new one. Eh? So like a kettle, so you basically throw it away, deploy a new one, and you're fine. Or you could say, no, I want to have granular control and have the ability to change certain configuration parameters during the life cycle of the operation of that thing. Right? And depending on the environment, uh, you have uh, uh, different approaches. But what you also have to bear in mind is that with this automation framework, we don't want to be limited to purely uh, cloud native application, we also want to control, for example, physical network elements. So we don't want to limit ourselves to that. So, and of course, when you go to a physical network element, like a top of rack switch or a, a device that is running into your network, you probably cannot just kill it and get rid of it and deploy a new one, right? So, so depending on the environment that you have, you can either use either approach. And as such, we believe that uh, that configuration management is also an uh, consideration that we have to take into account. At the moment in Nefio, we are focused uh, mainly on the first two pillars, right? But also the interdependencies between the pillars, right? So in other words, if I have a network function X and it has a set of requirements on the infra, we want to do that in a way that we can do that at scale. And secondly, that we can do that in a way that we uh, don't uh, that we have some organization boundaries that we take into account, okay? So what, uh, so high level goal that we have in, Net, in Nefio uh, is, first of all, it should be intent driven, right? So focus on the what, not on the how, okay? Secondly is if you look to the scale, we want to do that in a very scalable and distributed way. So you have central control, but then once you have defined what you want, you want the actual workloads to be independent operating, but if you see that there has to be some changes, you have the ability to uh, interfere with that. And then thirdly, we want to do that in a uniform way and try to have some guardrails around the changes that are happening in order to ensure that what you deploy is actually going to be right. Right? So, and we call that, uh, sometimes we call that shift left. So, we try to give you more and more tools to upfront try to validate what you are going to put on the runtime environment. Right? So, so that's part of the collaboration uh, part as well. So, so these are the three uh, main pillars. Now, to give you a bit more, because so far it was probably a little bit fluffy. So, I'm, I, I'm trying to give you an analogy on uh, how you should, let's say, look at this, the example that I'm trying to give, right? We all know probably Kubernetes on how it works. So we have clusters, we have nodes, and we schedule pods, right? All good. If you look to the approach that we have in Nephew, for us, the unit on which we schedule is a cluster, okay? We deploy network functions, so it's apps, and when we talk about the manifest, it's the apps related to that, uh, uh, the manifest related to that app. And then thirdly, I mean, I, people know when you schedule a pod on a Kubernetes, you can use daemon set, you can use uh, deployments, you can use stateful sets. So we have various uh, mechanisms to deploy it. We have a similar uh, approach, which we call package variant set, right? But so you can basically say, okay, I want to have this network function running on this set of nodes with these characteristics and so on and so forth, right? So you see there is a lot of analogy in how we are operating. Secondly, the use case that I'm saying, it's edge clouds and so on and so forth. You can see that in IoT or in other environments, it's a similar uh, type of thing that you need. You sometimes need to have the same thing deployed on various environments, right? That controller that you have here, uh, that does that fan out, if you will, or that scheduling, 
is not contained to network functions. I could deploy a, a set of manifests that uh, do something, right? So the same controller does that. So we want to make also generic building blocks that are reusable for multiple use cases because it's not, uh, if you do specific things, you have, uh, the problem space that Nephew, that we are trying to address in Nephew is huge. So we have to build these reusable components, which is something probably I will uh, repeat a few times. Now, so this is a bit high level what we want to do. So I'm trying to go into how we approach that, right? So first of all, we are a heavy consumer of KRM. We are 100% consumer of KRM. So we love the KRM model that Kubernetes came up with. And we uh, believe that it's uh, very important to standardize that whole automation system on that. OK? So why is that? Because the schema is well known. We have standard metadata tools. And so you can build very generic code on that KRM without understanding necessarily the full nitty-gritty details on what those things do. OK? So that's one. The second thing that we did or that we are using is we are using a concept called configuration as data. I don't know how many people have heard about this before. I'm expecting very few. OK? So it's a new approach. And by the way, if you scan this QR code, so this is uh, giving you a link to a website which have uh, uh, a lot of uh, information around that. But the approach is a little bit uh, different than what we, are, uh, what we have done so far. Is first of all, uh, we defined the configuration uh, artifacts. So we built a concept like a package. So what is a, a package is a consists of a bunch of let's say KRM files, YAML, in the in in the normal case. So and that can be anything, and that package is just a list of of uh, YAML representation that uh, together do some does something. In our case, it's deploying network functions potentially, or in the example I'm explaining, but it could be anything, right? On that that YAML or that package is version controlled. So you have a, a version backend on which that package is living. And so any change is version controlled, right? So any change that we do, uh, you know exactly when it happened, who did it, and that goes into the collaboration approach. And then you have a bunch of functions or controllers, what we call KRM functions, that act upon that package. So you could mutate. So for example, you say you, you create a package with uh, default namespace, and you say, I want to deploy this in this environment. You have a function to say, change the namespace from A to B. Right? Or a function, so you have these functions are, uh, I, first of all, there is a standard set of functions that are developed and already available. But we can develop those functions based on your needs. And that's what we are doing inside of uh, Nephew so far. Now, what is nice about the approach is that we have a full trail while you do changes and while you clone those packages towards your needs. So for example, you'll see in a bit that we will fan this out towards various environments. You get a trail towards the source. So that means that from the moment you do a change in one of your blueprints that you have defined, you can still trickle it back down all the way to the end where it was, for example, deployed. Right? So that means that you never lose track of a trail of the origin. And at any point in time, you can do a change, and it, it follows through all the way, which in my view is something that so far has not been uh, accomplished. And, and I think it's a very nice attribute, because that means that if you deploy or you define what I call a blueprint design, and you're going to use one for dev, prod, or uh, so on and so forth, you have that same set of capabilities. If sometime the blueprint changes, you can still do the updates and, and understand where it was deployed, who is using what, and so on and so forth. So, so that's a, a very nice uh, attribute. And the, the other thing is that those functions could be instantiated using containers and then the new hotness, which is WebAssembly. So you have the, so they are very tiny extensible, and you can basically uh, execute as you will. Now, of course, in order to make this work, 
I, there's one important thing is they have to be idempotent, right? So you have to write them in a way that they are idempotent because otherwise, depending on uh, if you get different results based on, on, on different environment, that will, uh, that, that's one thing. But the nice thing is they are very tiny and they are very extensible. So you can use them uh, in the context as, as you wish. Now, to give you a bit of context on Nephew, right? And so this is the architecture that we are, uh, let's say, adopting. So you have here on the, let's say, on the left-hand side, I believe, you have, uh, we have a management cluster on which a bunch of, let's say, controllers or functions. So we have the choice to use controllers and functions. They are going to do a number of things on a package. So the package is our unit that we operate upon. And so we have a bunch of controllers and functions that we are defining that are going to manipulate the contents of that package. So that could be mutating, we could do validating, and we can do generation of new KRM resources that we need. And I'll have an example in a bit that hopefully clarifies a little bit better of what I mean. Okay. Of course, that management cluster has a Git backend. So in order to ensure that we can do collaboration, that you have multiple organizations be able to act upon that package in a way that their responsibilities are set to perform a certain task within their organization. right? And then we have a set of workload clusters that are going to be the ones where the actual app, in our case, or in this example, a network function, is going to be deployed upon and is going to run which we call the runtime, right? Now, we have a layer in between. So people, when they look at the system, they say, OK, you're doing, let's say we are doing GitOps. Yes, we are doing GitOps. But so far, when, you, when people talk about Argo and Flux and stuff like that, it's typically I get a set of YAML files, and I synchronize them onto the cluster, right? That happens at the lowest layer, right? Where you see that we are using uh, configuration as data is all the way from the deployment side where, where potentially you run. So we are using at the moment config sync, but you could use uh, Argo or Flux. So all the way from th this guy where you start the, let's say, the intent, uh, the, the whole engine, all the way here, we are using configuration as data to do that manipulation and version control in that uh, scale out way with that uh, link back to the source always to understand from what the origin uh, is, right? And if you look here, I try to conceptually give you a, uh, what is happening on that management cluster uh, before you get deployed. So we have something what we call a blueprint package, which is, um, which is a set of manifests, so YAML, that someone defined. So in our case, it is a set of uh, uh, artifacts for a network function in the example that I'm explaining. And um, what happens then typically is you need, uh, uh, you need to put that onto a cluster, right? So that could be one, but that can also be thousands, right? So we have what we call a fan out aspect. So it's the same package that we take, we clone it for that particular environment, and we Add, so what we call injection, we add some context where that package and what is the context in which it operates. So that could also be prot, for example, dev and prot. Uh, so, so that could, uh, anything that you can imagine, the use case that I have is really the scaled out edge uh, deployment. So now that same package is uh, cloned towards a specific, let's call it instance on where this should run, right? But of course, if you say, I want to run on a specific cluster, you still need a set of attributes that are aligned with that environment. And that's what we call specialization. So specialization is, for example, I need an IP address of which is aligned with that subnet that is uh, provisioned on that site, or I need a VLAN, or I need another uh, context that is uh, specific to that environment. So during specialization, we again change the content of that package based on the let's say, functions and controllers that handle that, right? So what you see now, you have this uh, nice orchestrated system that at some point is going to result in something that you can deploy at runtime. And during this step, when you have done this whole hydration, as we call it, you have an artifact that you can 
control, so you can run it through a CI pipeline, you can do some validation upon, you can see what is the changes that you have from version one to version B. So we have full control over what are the changes that you're going to apply to the cluster in order to avoid any problems while you are deploying, right? That doesn't mean that nothing will, <laughs> uh, that everything will, will, will be nice, but so we are trying to limit uh, I, things that get deployed uh, and, and give you the controls to be able to, to handle that, right? Now, just to give you an example, uh, and maybe, I'm not sure <laughs> whether the example is very good, but I, what, you, what I try to represent here is to give you a bit of context on how this, this, this works. Is on the left-hand side, we have this blueprint package. As I said, any YAML or any KRM resource that you can think of, you can put in there. One important thing that I did not say so far is that not all of these KRM resources have to be applied to the API server, right? Because think of it, right? If we have 100,000 sites and we need, let's say, five IPs, we have half a million entries in the API server, right? So, so we also have a way to offload certain things because sometimes that IP address that you need uh, you don't necessarily need to put on the API server. It's an intermediate resource that gets scheduled in order to get to the final result, you see? So we also have a way to offload whatever is put in the API server, but you will see in a bit, we have a mechanism to give you the same philosophy that is happening on a controller uh, to act upon that. So that's the other uh, important aspect that you have to remember is that the content of a package, you have control over what you put you apply to the API server of Kubernetes and which pieces you don't, okay? And that allows, again, for scale, right? But you do not lose a number of things by doing so, okay? The second piece that is here is, and that's, by the way, also part of the package, it's a kept file. So we use kept and porch, which is the configuration as data. So what is in that kept uh, file is the pipeline of which functions and which controllers you actually use in order to do that specialization, okay? And then once that pipeline has run, you typically get, uh, you still have this manifest on how it started, but you can have new resources, KRM, that that whole specialization phase results in, right? So for example, here, the use case is new network attachment definition because we are using Multus and so on and so forth, but again, Think of this as a very generic approach. It can be, it go from A to Z, or it can mutate A to, with a little bit of mutation to A prime and so on and so forth. So any mutation and, and permutation is, is possible, okay? Now, what is important, I think, is also the approach to do that specialization because I think one thing that I like so much about Kubernetes is the, what I call, the loosely coupled framework. So you have a bunch of independent actors, right? That together achieve a certain goal, right? Would that not be great if we have the same thing that can act on that package that does that specialization, right? And that's what I call, or what we call, the conditional dance or the conditional choreography. So you have a set of independent actors. What are actors? They are either functions or controllers. So you have the choice what you pick, right? But together, they achieve a certain result, right? Now, why is this so nice, I think? Uh, if you look to when you schedule a pod on a Kubernetes cluster, you have actually the same dance. It's not explained in this way, but you have someone you need a CNI, right? So someone will take care of that. that. I need storage, someone will take care about that. You just see that that pod gets scheduled, and if something didn't work, you will see in the status why. Right? The same philosophy is sitting behind this, right? But we are applying it through the automation layer, right? And what that helps us to do is have these independent actors that together achieve a goal, right? And I call this personally, I call it the conditional dance or the conditional choreography. It's a very nice way to have independent actor act upon that KRM package that you saw and then mutate it, do all of this specialization, and do that in a very independent way that if you say, okay, we 
change one of these parameters, we can do that uh, independently. Okay. Also, what you see here on the slide is that you see this VLAN backend, IPAM backend. You can even do calls outside of the package, right? So it's not limited or constrained to KRM that is located. So you can even call out through an API system to say, hey, I want to reach out to an IPAM system or anything that you can imagine uh, to actually get uh, information about something, right? So it's not constrained to the functions or KRM that lives into the package. It can actually reach out to the outside world, okay? Now, uh, I talked about organizational uh, complexities, right? So I didn't go so much into the details uh, so far, but of course that whole system has to be built in such a way that people who are responsible for infra and people that are responsible for network functions or other roles that you have, I, you have security people and so on and so forth, can all do that in harmony, right? And as such, we have this concept of a consumer provider, so there is a clear delineation of who so, for example, the network function people want to have certain constraints to the infra, and you have a, sep so a consumer provider relationship, right? You see that the CRDs or the KRM that we have in that package have a clear role of who owns that and who acts upon that, right? So, you could have a consumer that says, I want an IP, and then the provider who is owned by the infra people actuate that, right? And then we have this loosely couple and this extendability framework that allows to add vendor extensions and so on and so forth because we did what I so the, the other nice attribute of that package is you can extend it with whatever KRM you want. If you say that your vendor has these specific attributes, you just basically say put the vendor KRM inside of that package and have a function that acts upon it and you're good to go, right? So that's the other, uh, I think, nice thing or property of that package is that it's not contained to a certain CRD. You can put any resource in that, okay? Now, probably we don't have a lot of time, so but what I wanted to do, so this is a very busy slide, but uh, what I wanted to do is, in Nefio, I, rather than building, okay, we are using the telco use case as an environment, but we are building these generic frameworks that help achieve those roles. So what we have, we have this, we act on KRM, we use packages, we use configuration as data, we use this fan out controller, so we use uh, this conditional dance and so on and so forth. So we are building a set of generic capabilities that I believe are applicable in various other domains, right? And I, I would love to talk to people to see how that would be applicable uh, and, and try to see uh, what their feedback is on that. So with that, I would like to thank you all uh, for listening. We are doing all of this in open source, by the way. So everything that I talked about is open. It's part of the LFN, uh, so Linux Foundation. Here are a bunch of links on how to follow and figure out what and what is going on. And uh, with that, I would like to thank you and open it for questions. I don't know whether we have time for questions or not, or no? Yes. I, I think there is a mic. With KPT, do you run some kind of KPT agent in the cluster? Sorry, yeah. With, with KPT, do you run some kind of KPT agent in every cluster, or what yeah, does I, KPT I will, yeah. do? So the, the question is, uh, do we run a KPT in the cluster? So in the management cluster, yeah, I did not explain that. Um, so KPT has a set of uh, attributes. So there is uh, Porch is a component of the configuration as data. So Porch is the, the, the backend that runs inside of the management cluster, and that has a Git backend, right? So. So that's the thing that we are using. So if you look to the management cluster specialization and all the fan out, that interacts with the Porch API, which is a Kubernetes API that we are talking to in order to then do all the changes to the, to the, the backend and to Git and to get this version control and so on and so forth. So, so there is a component of, of KPT, which is called Porch, that is doing that.